Well, hello. Welcome live from Washington, D.C. and being streamed to YouTube for either watching now or later. Welcome to a very special event in which the Atlantic Council, in partnership with the Author S. Fleming Awards, would like to recognize exceptional public service and how agencies and organizations can take the time to recognize the next generation of exceptional public service with the Author S. Fleming Awards. I'd like to open with a video done by our very own Peter Williams, president of the Author S. Fleming Awards Commission that highlights the importance of the Author S. Fleming Awards and exceptional public service and what we need to do. And now that video. In 1948, Arthur Sherwood Fleming delivered a guest speech to the downtown JCs on the importance of the three R's, recognizing, recruiting, and retaining excellence in the federal service. The message was so stirring that the JCs took it upon their organization to initiate an awards program for outstanding career civil servants. The JCs also proposed that the award be named for Dr. Fleming himself. Today, the award is given in five categories, applied science or engineering, basic science, leadership and or management, legal achievement, and social science. Some Fleming Award recipients are names you'd recognize, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Neil Armstrong, and Elizabeth Dole. There are many other recipients who you may not know, though all of their contributions have made the United States a better place. The federal government is made up of a lot of very hardworking, dedicated public servants, and they do their work quietly and under the radar. You know, not everything that we do is work that makes the headlines. We need great people in public service. These are hard jobs. They're challenging. They're important. And I think the Fleming Awards gives an opportunity for value to be attached and to be able to say, you're really doing a good job and you really need to keep doing that job because it's a great thing that you're doing for America. The qualities that I look for in a nominee are people who have gone above and beyond the descriptions in their job and who have sought to make life better for others. And I think the Fleming Award is one of those awards that agencies could be bragging about when they're out recruiting. It really is geared towards recognizing the best of the best. And I think it's important to recognize those individuals early in their career and not only, you know, give them the motivation to keep going and doing the good work that they do, but also inspiring the people that are coming up behind them and are going to make up the future leadership of our government. And I'm just proud to be a new member of that community. My challenge for the Fleming Awards is to make sure that it is fully inclusive of all kinds of folks from all kinds of disciplines. And if we can do that, then I'll be the happiest of campus. Since its inception in 1948, the Arthur S. Fleming Award has honored hundreds of exceptional civil servants, recognizing both the administrative and scientific side of the work public servants do. If you know of someone who stands out, please consider nominating them. Help us celebrate the next wave of public service leaders. Peter, over to you for some remarks. Well, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today at I should say that now in its 73rd year, the Arthur S. Fleming Award is the oldest private sector award recognizing excellence in achievement by federal government employees. Following the passing of Dr. Fleming in 1996, the program was adopted by the George Washington University School for Public Policy and Public Administration, now the Trachtenberg School. Since then, Dr. Kathy Newcomer, director of the school until a couple of years ago, and I have enjoyed a smooth and successful partnership managing the award. In my 48 year association with the Fleming Award, I can say that this transition was definitely the best thing that ever happened to the program. 
Nomination of the award are endorsed by agency heads or very senior staff at least, and are subject to a very rigorous evaluation process, first by expert consultants who are prominent in their fields. Their assessments are reviewed by the Arthur S. Fleming Awards Commission, which identifies 20 to 30 finalists whose nominations are then forwarded to a panel of distinguished judges who select the 12 award honorees. Occasionally, the judges have named 13 honorees for the award when it's been impossible to choose between two equally outstanding nominees. I know that the Fleming alumni all place the highest value on this honor among their achievements. And I know I speak for all of us who are engaged in this extremely worthwhile exercise when I say that it is a great honor to have played a part in celebrating outstanding success in public service. Thank you, Peter, for those great remarks. And you really have set the stage for why it's important that we recognize exceptional public service. Um, equally at the Atlantic Council with the Geotech Center, we're aware of how the world is changing rapidly, both in terms of data and technology and how that's creating strains on communities and societies and why public service needs to bring us together. I'd now like to welcome to the stage the very Dr. Catherine Newcomer that you mentioned, Vice President of the Author S. Fleming Commission and Professor at the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy at George Washington. Washington. Kathy, welcome to the stage. Over to you. Thank you very much, David. I am absolutely delighted to have the honor of introducing a true American hero, a man, a leader who is respected by both sides of the aisle in our Congress and has done so much for our country and the federal government in particular. Gene Todaro is the eighth Comptroller, Comptroller General of the United States. GAO is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. And Gene has been there for about two fifths of that time. He won an Arthur Fleming Award early in his career at GAO over 30 years ago. And he has been at GAO since then. He, we awarded him the Catherine Gebby Lifetime Achievement Award, the first of an Arthur Fleming Award who has continued to perform outstanding work for our government. He received the Gebby Award as well. He, not only has he been the Comptroller General for 11 years this December, but he also served as the COO of, in other words, he's been in the leadership role uh, at GAO for many years. He was a COO for nine years. I have, the, uh, the honor of actually getting to watch our wonderful leader up close as I have served on the Comptroller's Educators Advisory Panel, I think since it started like 10, 11 years ago. And I cannot tell you how honored I am to be able to join you in listening to our Comptroller General, Jean DeJaro. So Jean, welcome. And I'm gonna ask you some questions. So first of all, um, given how the unprecedented turbulent times in which we live, why is it so important to recruit and retain outstanding leaders to our government? Well, the United States, Kathy, faces uh, very significant uh, challenges, both from a national security standpoint and challenges to the economic security and well-being of the American people. They're both domestic, and international challenges. And it's important that we address known critical skill gaps that we already have uh, at the federal government and many ag important agencies, uh, but also to build the workforce for the future. Our country is only as strong as our government can make its contribution to that, along with the private sector and other important sectors of our economy. And you can't perform effectively as a government to protect the nation and secure uh, prosperity for our people without a strong federal workforce. Thank you. You know, before COVID, the, our federal government was already uh, embracing a, a huge transition to the digital world. So now that the pandemic has only accelerated some of this mega trend of, of the move to digital, what do you predict for the public service moving forward? What do you think the challenges or actually the opportunities as well? Well, technology is evolving the fastest it's ever been in, in mankind. And so it's very important that the government stay at the vanguard of these issues in order to effectively serve the American people. 
uh, technology is already changing where we work, how we learn, how we communicate. And all these things are effective if you're in the business of providing public service and making sure the government's effective and efficient. And then there are technologies that are emerging that are already going to make profound changes going forward. Artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, quantum computing down the road. So how the government does its work in serving the American people and what the government does is going to be very important to getting the benefits of these technologies while managing the challenges associated. And there will be challenges and limitations and risk associated with these technologies, both from a legal, ethical, and, and other dimensions. So the government has a definite role here and needs to uh, understand these technologies and to make sure that they serve the country and, and our citizens well. Thank you. Why, is, why should we be celebrating public service now? Why is it important to celebrate their achievements? Yeah, well, well, public service is a noble profession, and public servants aren't always fully appreciated. Uh, that's why I think the Fleming Award is so important, because it's a demonstration outside the federal government. Most of the people who have won the award, Fleming Award have been recognized within their agency, which is normal. But when you receive recognition from the private sector uh, and academia, and it's outside the federal government, it's particularly satisfying. And so I think it's very important. Now, public servants are, are uh, very much uh, unappreciated until there's a national emergency. You can look at the current pandemic where you know, uh, our uh, healthcare professionals have been outstanding. Uh, people have been providing at the federal level, a lot of assistance to public and private organizations to deal with the economic repercussions of the pandemic. And so, but, but they're there all the time. Federal employees are there all the time working uh, to benefit the American people. So whatever could be done to encourage them and show appreciation for them, I think is a good investment. Thank you. And I have one last question that others may be wondering as well. You received the Arthur Fleming Award as a young uh, leader at GAO over 30 years ago, but you've stayed. You've stayed your entire career and have moved into you know, higher and higher leadership positions. You could have gotten a job anywhere. Why'd you stay? Well, Kathy, uh, GAO has a tremendous mission. I mean, our job is to support the Congress in carrying out its constitutional responsibilities and to help improve the performance and accountability of government for the benefit of the American people. So it's a tremendous organization because we're government-wide in scope. Uh, there's tremendous diversity. We have an opportunity to make a difference by dealing directly with policymakers, not only in the Congress, but in the executive branch agencies across the spectrum of the federal government. And it's very rewarding to be able to do that. You know, I came into public service because I didn't want to be somebody who just complained about government. I wanted to get in the game and to uh, you know, continue to carry on, uh, you know, the government, but to fix these problems, to become an active participant. And by the way, I still consider myself a young leader. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gene. Thank you, Kathy. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Kathy. You both shared exceptional insights as to why it is so important to continue the torch for public service and how to move forward. Um, that is definitely the spirit of what the Author S. Fleming Awards are doing. And I'd now like to welcome two panelists to share their thoughts that extrapolate, again, more, more on the vein of why is it so important that we champion public service now amidst our rapidly changing world of data, technology, of society, and society issues that we need to address. Going first to James Christian. James Christian, welcome to the stage. And if you could share a little bit about your background and share us your thoughts as to why is it so critical that we champion public service now? Uh, yes, thank you. I um, am a former career executive. I've worked in the executive branch and the legislative branch. I've worked for the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Veteran Affairs, and the Government Accountability Office. Um, I am currently the Executive Vice 
vice president at the Partnership for Public Service, a nonpartisan nonprofit where we are working to build a better government and a stronger democracy. Uh, I must say, as a former Atlantic Council fellow, uh, Arthur Fleming awardee, um, as well as public servant, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to champion public service anytime I get. Uh, so to answer your question simply, it's that the stakes are, are too high. Uh, we must preserve the greatest public institution of our time, which I believe is our government. And it's also the greatest chance we have at improving the hundreds of millions of lives uh, around our country, as well as many more times that, that rely on the United States. Um, it's not just the health crisis and the pandemic, economic instability and vol volatility, social injustice and social unrest, internal law and order issues, international conflicts, humanitarian crisis and natural disasters, divided people and political thought and acceptable behaviors in society. It's the confluence of all of these factors happening at one time. And this is all in a growing velocity and an unknown trajectory. Um, at its core is trust in government. Uh, in 2020, uh, nearly 85% of people thought confidence in government could be improved. Around that same number thought the level of trust among people could be improved. Few and fewer people have the trust in government that they should, and we're being increasingly disconnected from our government, and people believe they're not representing them. Um, despite good intentions, federal employees are not seen as having the ability and the power and the influence uh, to, to change and help with consequential decisions. And I believe it's critical to address these things now so that we can be best positioned for the future. We need public servants. Uh, much of our interactions every day involve and in some respects rely on government. Uh, we need it to work effectively and efficiently for us. And importantly, we need the very best talent it has working on these incredibly challenging issues that we're facing. So we must champion public service to motivate those that are currently serving in it, attract future generations to bring their skills and abilities to it, and to showcase and make real the very good and necessary work that public servants are doing each and every day. Well said, James Christian, and thank you for those, those, those very inspiring remarks. Um, so I'd also like to welcome the stage, uh, Nithi, uh, if you could share your thoughts as well on the same vein as to why is it so important that we champion public service now? Why is it so critical? But first, if you could share a little bit about your background and then answer the question of criticality. Sure. Uh, so my name is Nidhi Singh Shah, and I work for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, I've been with the Department of Health and Human Services since the early 2000s, and currently I have been leading the work to design and implement quality reporting programs across the health insurance exchanges that were established by the Affordable Care Act. I also lead the strategic work related to quality measure development and identifying gaps in quality measures that clinicians report. So the goal of all of my work at CMS is really to drive improvement in patient and population health outcomes through quality measurement and value-based programs. Um, and so I would agree with everything that's been said about public service. Public service, whether it's local or state or federal government, or being in the military. I believe highlighting public service is so important. It's one way to give back to this country and to the communities that we live in. Um, my own parents, they came to this country, they became US citizens and instilled in me a sense of giving back to people and to communities. And both of my parents were professors and they eventually came to work for a city government in New York. And ever since I can remember, um, they have supported any and every election. They were working at the polls yesterday from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, and I tell you that to, to let you know that the sense of value for public service, that sense of value influenced me greatly. And so I have always believed that public servants defend and strengthen and improve the government institutions and programs that serve the public. And then hopefully the work of public servants reinforces the public's belief in these institutions, which can help further our democracy. So that cycle of valued work, serving people, serving communities, bringing about increasing trust and confidence in public service programs and institutions, that's so critical right now. And the other thing I would say is that public service can also help fix the brokenness that we see in this country. Um, and in my work to advance healthcare quality, I would say that there's so much broken across the healthcare system and there's so much inequity. And I work with my fellow government professionals, with quality measurement experts, with people in the healthcare industry to figure out how best 
to drive quality improvement in health outcomes in people through quality reporting programs. And what motivates me in public service is this great opportunity that I have to work to try to help advance health equity so that each and every person in this society can benefit and, and live the healthiest um, life possible. Well said, Nithi, and, I, and one inspiring both of what your parents did, what you do, and especially thinking about quality health outcomes, given everything we've just experienced in the last 18 months uh, with the pandemic. So incredibly well said. Um, I, I'm going to go ask you another question in James Christian in a moment, but I want to give a little bit of context to our listeners. Um, this is a chance for you to ask questions if you have them. Uh, later on, Kathy will be sharing both a website and email address if you want to email questions as well. But if you have questions, please do. And, and also, to give a little bit of context um, as to uh, why we at the, at the Atlantic Council also see the value of what the Authorized Funding Award Committee is doing. Um, back uh, on March 11th of 2020, the same day that COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, we also launched the Geotech Center, which was focusing on producing, among other things, a bipartisan Geotech Commission report focusing on how data and technology is changing the world. We didn't know at the time that we'd be launching the same day that the pandemic was gonna be declared 18 months ago, but we have successfully achieved our mission in May of 2021, the Bipartisan Commission with endorsements from Senator Mark Warner, Senator Rob Portman, as well as Representative Suzanne Delbene and Representative Michael McCall with bipartisan endorsement from both sides of the aisle, released 39 bipartisan recommendations regarding the future of data and technology for the United States like-minded countries and allies, and, and in cutting across some of the issues that you've already heard in terms of global s and leadership, secure data and communications, trust in the digital economy, resilient supply chains, global health technologies, commercial space technologies, and the future of work. All these issues, of course, are not possible if we don't have public servants that are helping champion and shepherd both at the local level and at the global level, how we navigate through this massive transition that's gonna be happening in the decade ahead. So Nithi, with that said, I'd like to go to you and say, what are ways in which the world is more strained or turbulent than the decades of past? You've already touched a little bit on the brokenness of the health system, but would be interested in your thoughts are, what are ways that public servants like current and past author Fleming S. Award winners are having to think differently about how they bring capabilities to navigate this changing world. So the first thing I would say is that there's so much information swirling around. Um, it's, it's sort of like information overload uh, across the internet, various media sources from everywhere. And so, um, and there are so many ways to communicate information as well. And so unfortunately, a huge challenge is the rise of false information. Um, and as federal government employees, I would say that we have a responsibility to be as transparent as possible with data, with facts, and really be the source of trusted, non-politicized information. Um, I think as public servants, it's also important to communicate effectively so in my work, there can be so many, and in many in other industries, there can be so many details and jargon and complexities in quality measurement science. But if we're trying to provide healthcare quality information to a person, we have to use clear, concise, plain language. Um, I've had the opportunity at CMS to help provide people with information about health plan quality as they are shopping for health insurance coverage on the marketplace. And to do that effectively, we have to understand what is important and meaningful to an individual first, and then provide people with critical quality information that can help them hopefully make informed healthcare decisions for themselves and their families. Um, and then another thing I would say is that with all this information, we definitely have a climate of increasing polarization of viewpoints. And so one thing we have to make sure is to gather those diverse sometimes opposing perspectives throughout the development of our work. So including patients and health plans, including clinicians, including state government folks um, from the beginning. So developing quality measures through the implement, in, implementation of various programs is definitely a changing world and a lot more information is online. However, nothing replaces engagement with people listening to the many voices. And I think as public servants, it's important to both educate and engage people with the institutions and programs that we work with. 
Extremely well said. And I liked how you touched upon how, in some respects, we're more awash in information than ever. Than ever. Uh, some of that is good quality information. Some of that is challenging information. So that those are huge challenges for a government in which people look to us to sort of provide a source of trust. And, and as you said, in some cases, there are dissenting voices, there are different perspectives. But again, that's what government is here for. We're here for all the people, not just a select group of people. And we need to represent that. And that is clearly why the value of public service to be that bridge in navigating that period of information overload, questions of, of, of how do we provide information in a way that's understandable is so key. Uh, so James Christian, I'll ask you the same thought, which is uh, what are ways that public servants, both current and former Fleming Award winners and more are having to think and do things differently given our rapidly changing world? Yeah, yes, it's um, uh, unquestionable the world is changing and it has changed. Um, and I'll focus you know, mainly on expectations and technology. So we need to acknowledge that there's been increasing expectations on and of government. Uh, and this is from a customer service perspective, transparency and accountability perspective, and ability for a career workforce to uphold our constitution, values, and a nonpartisanship stance. Um, politics are ugly and career public servants must avoid this very difficult trap into playing into it. Uh, on the technology side, uh, it provides an abundance of opportunities, but also comes with risk. We must quickly and safely and appropriately incorporate technology in our work. Think of ethics with respect to AI, uh, fairness when it comes to access and privacy when it comes to trust and security. Uh, Fleming awardees highlight the very best of our government. They've leveraged technology and innovation and leadership to bring new capabilities and efficiencies for those they serve. Uh, most recent winners uh, have used technology to improve sustainable agriculture, to measure weather patterns and quality of goods or resources. Um, improve identifying bad actors and wrongdoing, improve access to health care and medicines, um, and enhance interactions uh, with and among government agencies. I'm also, you know, I'm not ashamed to say I only half comprehend many of the accomplishments uh, for Fleming Award winners, uh, but I am really glad that these smart, talented, and dedicated public servants are working hard uh, every day for us. Uh, and as a technology, attitudes, and, expectation, and expectations continue to change, It'll be increasingly important for us to keep up, remain vigilant, uh, to continue to understand how technology expectations and society itself are interacting with one another uh, and support public uh, servants that are working to address these many issues, uh, as well as the opportunities that are facing our country and the world more broadly. Well said, James Christian. And, and given that some of the Authorized Fleming Award winners in the past later went on to win Nobel Prizes, if you're doing half, that, that's still an impossible accomplishment. <laughs> and it does point on that, that we're in a world that's changing so rapidly that none of us have all the answers, that it really does require a community and public service to make it happen. As you said as well, with data and technology, uh, there is a need to maintain a nonpartisan stance to not get pulled into the politics of the day. Uh, I'm reminded of what uh, President Lincoln said, which is, I do not like that person. I must get to know them better. It is a public servant people that have the responsibility responsibility to get to know people better. Um, so now I'd like to go to a final round of questions, uh, starting again with James Christian and then Nithi. James Christian, uh, how can folks support the Authorized Fleming Awards? Uh, how can they take the time to recognize a world that we've got to do tackling new frontiers of science, public health, public service, countering social inequities that need to be remedied, remedying historical social injustice, countering misinformation, disinformation, remedying polarization? That's obviously a lot to do. How can people support the Authorized Fleming Awards? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That's, that's, that's quite a lot, uh, but it's important to recognize um, public servants. Uh, I would start by saying just to extend grace, given that public servants are people and facing similar issues, particularly in this time right now, uh, as we all are. Uh, I would extend appreciation, not just during public service recognition week uh, and not just uh, during, you know, for our most popular public servants or political leaders, but for everyone and every day. Uh, learn more about our government and what it's doing every day. Keep high expectations and continue to provide constructive feedback. Um, I would share stories of positive interactions and things that you're grateful for that government is doing every day uh, and begin to try to normalize that we are trying to lift up public service. And then obviously I would encourage everyone to nominate those public servants that they believe are doing an exceptional job for the Fleming Award and many other great ways that we can support uh, and recognize public service. Well said. And also want to give thanks to you, James Christian, for everything you do as a positive change agent and everyone at the Partnership for Public Service to also champion this charge. Thank you for that. Uh, Neethi would go to you now for similar thoughts as to how folks can support the Authorist Fleming Awards and recognize public servant leaders. 
Yeah, I agree. I do hope more agencies submit nominations for their staff and leaders for the Fleming Awards. It is such an honor to be a recipient. Um, and recognizing the diversity of public servant leadership, a- attracting diverse individuals into public service, mentoring the next generation, all of that is so important. Um, not only to have a sustainable workforce, but also to highlight new, creative, innovative ideas that are coming from within the government. Um, I think we can support and highlight the ways that public servants are positively impacting society. Um, so one thing I want to mention is that I think there will always be at some level polarization and injustices and inequities. However, recognizing public servants and investing in their work to combat and decrease those harmful things can help um, promote government work for the public good. Um, so I think showing how public service can play a beneficial role in actually improving lives um, will be critical. Well said, and and like you said, um, if it, it, we we can't just sit on the sidelines and be problem admirers. We have to figure out how we encourage everyone to be problem solvers and champion those who are in the thick of things to try and solve it and move things forward. Because if not now, then when? If not us, then who? So so thank you for those wonderful remarks. Thank you, Nithi. Thank you, James Christian, for all that you both do as positive change agents. And I now like to go back to Kathy Newcomer, uh, Dr. Newcomer. Your thoughts uh, on on both what you just heard and then how can folks actually find more details about nominating people for the Author S. Fleming Awards? Well, I found everyone who has spoken before me extremely inspiring, and I thank them for their service. I want to also point out that David is a a Fleming Award winner, and not surprisingly for the creative and innovative work he did in information technology within the federal government, as he continues to to act in the public uh, public interest. uh, He is a wonderful example of the kind of impact that Fleming Award winners have made. I want to, before I get to any of the nitty gritty about uh, the nomination process, I want to point out that Arthur Fleming served nine presidents of both parties, and he was a a leader, a really path-breaking leader in talking about social equity. He was the head of the Civil Rights Commission. He was the secretary of HEW, which is now HHS. Um, And Social equity was a great uh, focus of his literally 70 years ago. And that is something that has been a part of the Arthur Fleming Awards since the beginning. Again, 73rd year. That it's not only that these leaders do go above and beyond their work and show creativity and innovation in their work in public service, but they are aware of the need to achieve equitable outcomes for all in society and to figure out how do you reduce the disparities and inequities. And this is something that he was pioneering for many, many years through many positions for many presidents. And that is it. And it's interesting to be frank, we in the nomination form have been trying to explain what social equity is. <laughs> and finally, I think in the last few years, people kind of get it. But seriously, you know, uh, if you think back 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, um, talking about social equity was not something that everybody was doing all the time. In our, as you know, in our society, there have been waves of, of interest, uh, but it's not something that has been uh, at the you know, forefront of people's minds. And that's something that makes me extremely proud to be involved with an award that looks for leaders who don't just want to save money for government to make things more efficient, but equity as well as efficiency, as well as effectiveness, as well as quality of services, as we've heard today. Um, These were all concerns that Arthur Fleming uh, was very bold uh, and very uh, outspoken about for literally, you know, uh, his over like 70 year career. And that's why I think that this award is something that stands out. Yes, it's the oldest award, from outside of government for government employees. 
Yes, it is extremely prestigious because the, the head, whether it's the secretary of energy or the administrator of the EPA or Jean Dodaro, the head of the GAO, they sign the nomination form. It is something that is that the first of all, the nominees are vetted within their agency. Then we have a three step process. Uh, with, at the Fleming Awards, where we have consultants that look at the specific technical details. And yes, James Christian was very right. You wouldn't, you know, well, David wouldn't imagine, but it is hard to imagine the amazing scientific uh, work and applied technology work that has been undertaken by our award winners. So we have consultants who have the technical expertise, we have the commission, and we have judges who are all outstanding public servants, have served for many years. Oh my gosh, we probably have, you know, 300 years of service if you add up all the years of the, the judges' uh, years in serving our, our, uh, our nation through their work. And so it, it is a great honor. You get a beautiful gold medallion with Arthur Fleming's uh, name on it. And as was mentioned in the video, there's great predictive validity. The people who win those awards go on to do many things. I mentioned that Jean Jadaro was our first Lifetime Achievement Award for um, an Arthur Fleming Award, but Tony Fauci was the second. He's pretty well known. And he's also very similar to Jean Jadaro, stayed at the same agency for over 50 years. And, the, and Elizabeth Hanford, now Elizabeth Hanford Dole, was the first woman. You know, back, back in the day, 73 years ago, it was for men only. But starting in the 70s, it was like, wait a second. And, and frankly, probably the, you know, at least 50% of our winners for the last 20 years uh, are women. And they represent uh, many agencies. But the point of this presentation today is so let's we want to reach even more agencies. There are the people that have been receiving awards, for example, by at NIST, at Department of Energy, at GAO, the Air Force, uh, CDC, uh, NIH for many years, but we're really looking to expand uh, to a larger number of agencies. The deadline is January 31st. And I know in the chat, we've put the, um, the website. It's an all electronic process. And the only thing I would add is that given the focus that Arthur Fleming throughout his career had on social and racial equity, I, that is, that's a part of the, um, the nomination process is we need to hear the accomplishments and the impact that the nominees have had. I hope that helps, David. It's very helpful, Kathy, and, and and it's just amazing, again, as you said, to recognize that Arthur S. Fleming was not only a true uh, public service leader, he was also tracking massive scientific advancements that happened throughout his career, um, but like you said, he was championing social equity probably at least half a century before it really reached the public's consciousness, and, and it, of course, was long overdue and is something that we continue to need to advance, as we've heard already from Nathan and James Christian. There are things that need to be fixed, there are things that need to be addressed, there is polarization that needs to be uh, remedied as well. Um, and then the email, if I want to get it correct, is Fleming Awards, all one word, that's F-L-E-M-M-I-N-G-A-W-A-R-D-S at G W edu So Fleming Awards at gwu.edu if people have questions. Um, I, I'm going to put our, our, our panelists on the spot because we have a little bit more time. I'm going to go first to Kathy, then I'm going to go to uh, James Christian, then to Nithi, and then Peter, if you will close out for us, I want you to share real quick your vision of hope for, for, for the future ahead, how public service can play a role in fixing it. So maybe Kathy, I'll go first to you to share your thoughts before we go and, and, and wrap things up. So Kathy? So that's an easy one for me. I have been teaching uh, Master of Public Policy, Master of Public Administration, PhDs in Public Administration and Public Policy at George Washington University for 40 years. I have the honor, the privilege to teach these wonderful people who come in and are excited about going into public service. I probably have at least 150 of my alumni from my classes who work at GIO alone. And so I am continually 
continually uplifted by the excitement and the desire to make a difference that my hundreds and hundreds of students right here at the George Washington University uh, have shown. I know they are going to continue making a difference. And when I go to my class tonight at six o'clock and I look at these folks, I know that we are in good hands with the next generation. Well said, Kathy. And I think and aside from us having a shared tie through the Fleming Awards, I believe it was a Dr. Pavia Law who is now chief of staff at NASA, where we also had a connection there as, as one of your PhD uh, students and now graduates. So thank you for that, Kathy. Um, James Christian, over to you. As to, to, so what is your vision of hope for the future and how public service can play a role? Yes, and uh, thank you for that, Kathy. I, I teach at the Maxwell School, and I will uh, now have some more material for my students to go over. Um, you know, I will simply just say three, three things here. Um, first, and I often say this, there are things that only one can do in government. And my hope is that people realize, those current public servants, that it is an opportunity of a lifetime and an honor to serve our government. Um, that is my first hope. The second is that the public, that public servants serve, realize that you have smart, talented, dedicated people working on your behalf every single day. Uh, and then the third thing that I hope that I hope for is that we come together um, in all of our collective goodness to work on the most pressing and challenging uh, issues of our time. As I've said before, there is so much before us. It is imperative that we get it right for future generations, and we will only do that uh, collectively and together. So that is my hope that those who serve uh, understand the opportunity before them and the nobility of serving. Uh, those that it, that government does serve recognizes the, the talent that is working with them every day and that it will be the collective good that allows us to uh, take advantage of opportunities and mitigate any challenges before us. Well said, James Christian, and agree if you wholeheartedly. It's going to require us collectively to come together to chart the path of the future ahead. Very well said. And so, Nithi, over to you for your thoughts about the future, what gives you hope, and how public service can play a role as well. I think very similarly, I think what gives me hope is a collaborative society. So whether it's federal government collaborating with the private sector, collaborating, collaborating across agencies, um, collaborating with local and community leaders. Um, you mentioned social and racial equity. I think that you know, plays a role in health and health plays a role in social inequity. So it's, it's all interrelated. And so, you know, collaborating and learning from each other, I think gives me hope for the future. Well said, Nidhi. And I really liked how you said that, again, it's, it's about the social interactions with individual health, community health, that it is all interconnected. And we are ever striving towards that more perfect union to address uh, things that have been inequities in the past to have a better future, both for our nation and for the world as a whole. So Peter, you've been given a pretty high bar by all the people that came before you. Uh, can you rise to the occasion? Peter, what gives you hope and how public service can play the role as well? Well, I, I would say we go ever upward. Um, it's the, the, the bar has been pushed higher and higher, uh, even since the time when you won it, David, you know, I first <laughs> met you, <laughs> it's been pushed up even higher. And uh, sometimes I think one of the uh, commentators earlier said that, well, I think uh, James Christian said that I'm not sure I understand what they were doing, yeah. but that's, we read some of these, you know, we see all the nominations on the commission and some of them, they leave your mind spinning. You think how on earth does somebody have the intellectual capacity to do this. And then we, they try to explain to us what they're doing and it just is awe inspiring. And my hope would be that that uh, initiative to inspire continues. And I think one of the things which I remember Arthur Fleming, a dear friend of mine, that always said in all his speeches that he gave down through the years when we co-hosted the uh, Fleming Awards dinners together, it's he would say, we are recognized the people who go the extra mile. And I think that's it's above and beyond, but it's going the extra mile, not just stopping because I've done my job, but going that much further, searching and seeking. And then you end up with people like Tony Fauci, as mentioned earlier, Gene, both of whom are, I was happy to be able to present the award to them back in the days when they won. When they huh. were. And I, you know, Gene's support is incredible. He has always been very, very supportive. And, uh, and and Tony's a 
one of those people, you can call him and leave a message, and he calls you back, even in his busy, busy schedule. And so I appreciate it. it shows that they don't just keep in their own little world. They both of them reach out beyond. We need more Tony Fauci's and more Gene Dodaro's, and I think we are recognize some that will come through. I think of those who passed on. Uh, John Volker, for example, who passed away a couple of years ago, he won the award at the same time as Senator Moynihan. They were co-winners in the same year in 1983 or something like that. Uh, so earlier than that, 1953. So it's that hope that we're talking about must be kept alive. We must have a, a, a candle or a light that constantly burns. But I'm sure the aspiration and the need to, how should we say, uh, emulate those who have gone before is a tremendous inspiration for people of tremendous talent. And God knows we've got talent in the U.S. government. And thank God for it. Thank you. Well said, to do this today. You definitely, you definitely rose to the occasion. You, you, this is a wonderful summary of why the Author S. Fleming Awards are so important, why recognizing public servants are so important. We encourage everyone listening and watching to this. If you have any questions, to please email Fleming Awards again at G wu.edu, gw.edu, that's Fleming Awards, one word, Fleming with two Ms. And as you said, Peter, it is about making sure we carry on the torch forward. We have the talent, but we have a responsibility both to recognize, to provide grace, and to recognize that we can't get through this period of transition unless we all come together collectively to move forward. With that, I want to thank all our distinguished conversations and panelists today. Uh, thanks to Jean as comptroller for GAO. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Nini. Thank you, James Christian. And thanks to the Atlantic Council for hosting this. And then we'll close again, recognize and nominate the importance of public servants. And please be bold, please be brave, and please be benevolent for the future ahead. Thanks again. Thank you, David.